Although Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead remake lacks the existential dread of Romero's 1978 classic, it does a surprisingly good job of adapting the source material into a more kinetic and unrelenting adventure. I've always wondered, would I survive the Dawn of the Dead? And if so, how? The answer is likely no. I don't do enough cardio, I'm not skilled in handling weapons, and haven't had much experience surviving in the wilderness. So, statistically speaking, without the kind of plot armor that protects Anna for much of the film, I, like most people, would probably go within the first week. But maybe if we follow the major events in the film, the obstacles our main characters encounter, and the decisions they make along the way, we can improve our odds and figure out how to survive the Dawn of the Dead. Now, before we judge mistakes certain characters make, we have to remember that nobody, absolutely nobody, other than a handful of serious doomsday preppers will be ready for what's about to come. This is why you might want to pay attention to the news. Dawn of the Dead is set in 2004, when Facebook and other social media platforms were in their infancy, so you can't rely on tweets, stories, or Facebook posts for information. Am I missing something? Why did Dr. Cho order a head x-ray when the man was bitten on the hand? Uh, here he is. They had him backwards. Solomon Edward, he's upstairs in ICU. From a bite? If you notice that there's an alarmingly high number of people with fevers and bite marks in the hospital you work in, you need to gather all the information you can, so pay attention to the news. It's your only hope. I know you've had a rough shift at work and want to listen to some music, but you really don't want to miss the radio updates about the undead. Save the shower sex for later and keep your eyes glued to that TV set. A second hot tip, if you wake up in the morning and see your neighbor's kid standing in your hallway covered in blood, don't run up to them. That's an embarrassing way to get your throat torn out. Also, I know that your head is spinning and you've just lost the most important person in your life, but that life is over and you need to tap into primal survival mode. And when your significant other dies and comes back to life wanting to eat you, make like Anna, grab those car keys and drive. <laughs> With the metropolitan and suburban regions of Milwaukee up in flames and swarming with infected, you need to head out into sparsely populated areas like national parks, hills and remote coastlines. Be careful on the road though, we lose a lot of folks right at the beginning to reckless driving, like this idiot doing 100 into a T-junction. So don't speed, go smashing into cars or sliding into gas stations. Lock your door to protect yourself from unwanted intruders, otherwise you may lose control of your vehicle like Anna. Say something. Please. As you start to brave the undead filled streets, start to understand your enemy. If you're familiar with the OG Night of the Living Dead zombies, there were shambling messes who barely had the energy to land a good chump on their prey. However, things are totally different this time around with the Snyder zombies running full speed with malicious intent, as if they were infected by some sort of rage fires. The only way to fully take down a zombie is to destroy their brains, and if you followed the first step about watching the news, Sheriff Cahill lets you know that headshots and burning bodies are two of the most effective ways to fight them off. You won't always have access to your gun or bullets, so don't be afraid to get crafty. Employ some Krav Maga, swing a croquet mallet, or launch a crowbar through a zombie's skull. Or better yet, lure a number of them towards you and then drop a piano onto them from above. If you find yourself surrounded, be sure to utilize gas tanks. Bullets and supplies are limited, so make the most of what you have. And if you're fortunate enough to stumble into someone like Kenneth... You ready to roll? You coming with us? Nah, you coming with me. Follow him. He knows what the hell he's talking about. The mall is a solid place to bunker up thanks to its shatterproof glass, so Anna and the gang have the right idea when they head there. But keep in mind that there might be some power-hungry mall cops waiting for you inside. Don't let them take advantage of you or let them order you around like cattle. Remove CJ from power and get back to business, but also seriously listen to his security concerns. He might come off like a prick, but he brings up some valuable points, and he actually ends up being one of the most reliable members of the group. Now that you have control, disable the elevators, take advantage of your surroundings and get prepared. There's enough food and water here to last you several months, but you can't lull yourself into a false sense of security. In the meantime, secure the location. The zombies have physiological limitations. They are, after all, humans that have been infected with the virus. And since they respect the first law of thermodynamics, your best bet is to wait for them to either starve or die of dehydration. Study a map of the mall and know where the exits are in case you need to make a quick escape. Reinforce all the doors, cover up the windows, arm yourself, and employ the buddy system, so that there's always at least two people together watching each other's back at all times. 
Next step is to stock up on supplies and equipment. Secure some bags and load them up with water bottles, non-perishables, walkie-talkies, torches, radios, batteries, medicine, weapons, and store them on the roof. With the high ground advantage, the roof will serve as the last line of defense and as the primary evacuation point until another plan is agreed upon. Communication is vital, so everybody should carry a walkie-talkie from this point so that everything becomes coordinated. Raid the freezers of restaurants inside the mall and move the fridges and the remaining survivors up to the top floor, just below the roof. If the glass doors keeping the zombies outside shatter, it won't be long until the entire ground floor is overrun, so everybody should steer clear of the first two levels once everything's been raided. Throw out your clothes and upgrade to survival wear. You need something comfortable that you can work, sleep and run in. You never know what's around the corner, and if you have to move quickly, you don't want to be held back by skinny jeans or baggy clothing that's going to get caught on something. One bite and you're gone, so you can't wear singlets or shorts anymore either. Long sleeves are your safest bet, and provided it's not too hot, wear a few layers and get crafty by taping magazines to your arms and legs and wearing gloves, especially when going on the offensive. The same thing applies to feet. Get yourself some sturdy hiking boots that have decent grip. You're going to be on your feet a lot, you'll often have zombies on your heels, and absolutely cannot afford to trip over or slip. Once things are secure, you may want to alert other folks to your presence so that they can help you. But be careful, drawing the attention of survivors will likely garner the attention of nearby zombies too, as will gunshots and other loud noises. Hey look over there, there's someone on the roof. Painting help messages on the roof is a great idea, but don't rely on the military or government coming to help you. Your life is in your hands, so definitely don't put too much faith in assholes like Steve either. That guy continually shows that he cannot be trusted, and that he cared only about himself. Helping people can spell doom in other horror franchises, but this time around, it seems like a pretty safe bet to help other folks out when possible. The more people we have, the more work we can get done. But if anyone brings in a woman with a massive bite mark on her arm that's turning purple, she's about to turn into a zombie. The fucker's got to go! Go! The fucker's got to go! Even if we don't fully understand what's going on, Anna is a nurse and should have already picked up that this was some sort of virus and that quarantine protocols were needed to be put into place. While in Romero's universe, anyone who dies can become a zombie, here, only those that have been infected will turn. So, if you know someone has been bitten, shoot them right away. It'll be tough, and people might not be happy with you for making the executive call, but you know it has to be done. If you notice that someone won't let you see a member of their family that you know is injured, and they keep sneaking off with restraints, that's probably a good sign that something foul is at play. Whether they're infected or not, no one will let you take their family without a fight, so be prepared for shit to go down. You wanna kill Luda? You wanna kill my family? Something else that's notable about these zombies is that they don't seem to want to eat any living thing that isn't a human. When our group sneak down into the basement, they find a dog named Chips that had been living safely amongst the infected. Because dogs aren't in danger of being attacked, and there will likely be thousands of ownerless strays in the street, use them to your advantage. Train them to carry supplies between locations, and if you have a shepherd dog, you might even be able to herd the zombies into designated areas so that you can slaughter them en masse. That being said, though dogs are awesome, and you should probably adopt one from the pound today, another hot tip is, don't get distracted by pups, as a ninja zombie might surprise you from above. Befriending the guy who owns the gun store across the street is a terrific idea, and you're going to want to make that connection sooner rather than later. The characters make signs and chat with Andy across the street, who not only has a ridiculous supply of weapons and ammunition, but also has the kind of aim that would make Hawkeye jealous. Yet for some reason, despite his malnourished state, they take their sweet time and don't make moves to save him until the end. They concoct the plan to use the dog they found, however, the zombies end up following Chips into the gun store and biting Andy. A way to get around this is to radio in ahead of time. Alert him before you make moves and give him a chance to shoot the zombies outside his store, so that he can properly close the door. As chaotic as the rescue attempt was, the gang were able to secure some more weapons and ammo, but instead of using the gun store as a fort and methodically wiping out the 5,000 or so zombies outside the mall, they make the bold decision to leave the place altogether. Deciding to make a dash for the marina, with hopes of sailing away from the infected to a nearby island, the gang take our Get Crafty tip seriously, and end up reinforcing buses with snow plows, barbed wire and metal railings. They even deck the inside with a chainsaw. 
A hot tip though, if you decide to operate one of these stations, turn that bad boy off when the vehicle's in motion. Arriving at the marina with zombies hot on their heels, Michael, who we discover had been bitten, sacrifices himself by staying behind as the others sailed away. The remaining survivors drift for days and finally arrive on the island, only to find themselves overrun by zombies. Although they rather successfully executed much of their plan, the moment they stepped foot on the boat, they started getting complacent. And by the time they arrived at the island, the group were in the same position they were at the start of the film, helplessly underprepared and overwhelmed by what lay ahead. Their biggest problem at the end was that they saw the boat as a means of transportation and not as a viable home. While living life out on the water for extended periods isn't ideal to the uninitiated, and I personally would have never left the safety of them all to begin with, it's the safest place you can be right now. Once on the boat, check up on your supplies. The key will be to wait until the zombies starve or dehydrate to the point of collapsing before trying to get back on land. This should be possible with enough supplies, but it requires discipline and direction. You can't just float aimlessly around without a goal. There's always going to be several yachts anchored in marinas, harbors, and just off the coast, out of reach for zombies. So it's time to become a pirate and carefully steal from every empty ship you encounter. You may even want to have two or three boats to reduce risk. Two filled with survivors, equipment, and supplies, and another one that you can send out to loot and investigate with. With a bit of practice, you'll be more comfortable with seafaring, and although you're enclosed by Lake Michigan, which is the body of water surrounding our heroes in the film, you can carefully sail all the way towards Montreal, hugging the shores and looting ships as weeks turn into months. I know the group wanted to head to a specific island, but chances are that other than fishing, it would be difficult to find enough food for everyone there. I would instead make my way to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and onto my final destination. A sparsely populated part of Greenland, which shouldn't be hard as Greenland is the least densely populated territory in the world, with 0.028 people per square kilometre. It's at this point that we send one of the ships out with a scout team to check if the coast is safe. Other than a handful of newly infected individuals, most of the zombies should be dead by now. From here it's up to us to find shelter, maintain supplies, protect the group by training everyone to use a firearm and actively patrolling the surrounding area daily. Greenland is rich in wildlife and with a system of fishing, hunting and water collection in place, this would make a terrific new home. Now that we've survived the dawn of the dead, we have to stay vigilant, continue to adapt and never get complacent, for a broken and lawless world now awaits us.